I want you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to preach this morning on the topic of the great divorce. And in the preaching of the topic of the great divorce, I'm in no way insinuating that God and Satan were married and getting a divorce. That's the noun form of divorce. But there's also a verbal form of divorce, and that's the definition I'll be using. But I do want us to think of a court-like proceeding over the next three weeks because we're going to also talk about the ensuing custody battle. And then on week three, we're going to look at the child support issues that's, that, that's, that's, in, that's for us in, the, in our father's care. So the great divorce, and of course we know that in Genesis chapter 3 is the original rendering of this great divorce. That's the fall of man. And in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, you can see a whole kind of scope out there in half of that verse. And you can look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And then what we're doing this morning is just fast forwarding to the end of the ends. And that's Revelation chapter 12 where we come together with the war with the God of heaven, the angels of heaven, and the great dragon that he was so large that his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky. And we understand that to be the demonic minions of Satan now today and what he's trying to do on the face of the earth since the time of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when that serpent slithered into that perfect place and brought us to man's choice instead of God's choice for man. And we know that what that set up was the Redeemer. And in the fullness of God's time, he sent forth his son, Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that Jesus accomplished what arts couldn't do and what judges couldn't do and what kings couldn't do and all of those things prophets couldn't get it done Jesus did it he is our only hope of redemption if anybody ever promises you salvation outside of Jesus Christ I can tell you you can sum them up in one word liar there is no other name by which man must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ So divorce, of course, in the noun form is a legal dissolution of marriage by a court or another competent body. But here's the way that I'm looking at it this morning from the verbal aspect. To separate or disassociate something from something else. So it's the separation aspect of God and and Satan. I want us to draw a firm line. Not in the sand. I could care less about the sand in your soul in my soul I need us all today to have a very firm line drawn that there is a full separation divorce between God and Satan and I want us to fully understand and comprehend to the best that we can in a 30 minute time slot that we must get ultra serious in our personal relationships with Jesus Christ to live that firm and full separation. The divorce, the great divorce between God and Satan in each of our lives. So what I want us to do this morning is to truly explore a little bit about the divorcing nature of God and Satan. I got three little little quill points this morning. Nothing revelatory, nothing you've not heard before. They don't rhyme, they don't start with the same words. I don't care about any of that stuff this morning. I need us to know fully and firmly the separation that God expects us to exhibit in each of our lives. Point number one, speaking of the separation, the divorce, the dissolution, of God and Satan's relationship in heaven. Let me tell you this. Here's point number one. They are never, ever, ever getting back together again. (laughs) Point number one. They are never, ever, ever getting back together again. I don't know if the words of Taylor Swift have ever made it into a Christian sermon or not. But I want to read you one of the verses of her song, We are never, ever, ever getting back together again. Here they are. We are never, ever, ever getting back together. We are never, ever, ever getting back together. You go talk to your friends, talk to my friends, talk to me. But we are never, ever, ever, ever getting back together again. Like never. (laughs) 
Now she's talking about human relationship, but I want you to hear very clearly that God and Satan are never, ever, ever getting back together again. Point number two. We need to stop trying to get them back together. Now here's where we'll spend the bulk of our time. If it is firmly established that the breakup is forever, for all of eternity, and the Bible has established that, God has banished Satan and that one third of those rebellious angels that were allegiant to him, God banished them from heaven. Now we do know Satan has limited access. No doubt about that. We learned that from the book of Job. Satan was up there. However, Satan goes around doing his thing. I'm glad to know he was up there talking to God because I feel like most of the time he's back in my backseat of my vehicle. <laughs> but we understand. I don't, under, I don't know how all that works. I know there's very strategic planning and placement. I understand he's got a masterful way of using strongholds and curses. I understand the demonic activity to the best that I can. And you say, man, you should, at this point in your life, you should be well educated past believing in all that fantasy stuff. Well, let me tell you something. You let that fantasy stuff run wild in your family if you want to. I'm going to go ahead and just trust in the word of the Lord. I'm going to keep on pulling down strongholds in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep on breaking curses through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep on pleading the blood of my Savior over my house and my family and my church and my health and our children in this church. I'm just going to keep on doing things God's way. I'm not going to get so educated that I don't believe Jesus Christ resurrected from that grave and he's coming back to get me again. My Jesus is not just a story. He is my Savior and he's coming to claim his bride well you can't hang out with the liberals well good but I can tell you what you guys can hang out with me and I hope that as any liberal hangs out with me they lose a little bit of their liberality and I could care less if they're considered as conservative I want them to get into God because God is what's going to cure every person on the face of this earth. You know who's going to take care of China? Is it going to be the U.S.? No, it's going to be God. You know who's going to take care of Vladimir Putin? Is it going to be Ukraine? No, it's going to be God. Do you know who's going to take care of a worldwide famine? Is it going to be a World Health Organization and food banks? No, it's going to be God. When God's people get hungry, they're going to give manna if they don't get nothing else. Our God will make it rain from heaven to feed us, baby. Put you some food up. But keep your hands up the whole time. And say, God, I'm going to prepare the best I can. But there's some things I just can't prepare for. But Lord, you've already prepared for it all. And I'm just going to trust you. And Lord, if it takes an extra day for the water to come from the rock, help me to keep my mouth shut. I don't want to be like those quibbling uh, people out there in that Sinai desert. Lord, I just want to wait on you and see the handiwork of our God. Lord, give me that kind of faith and patience. Because see, that's what our world needs to see. Our world has seen nothing but a weak church that gripes and groans and grumbles more than the world does about what their God can do but yet doesn't do why can our God do all that he's done but yet doesn't do it in our generation because we won't quit trying to get him and Satan back together again Taylor said it best they are never ever ever getting back together again but we live lives trying to mix the two together I have people all the time says, well, it doesn't matter if we're sleeping together. We love each other. No, because you love God and because God loved you enough to die and raise again for you and to return you, you need to get some self-control to understand that just because you're in love with somebody, you don't have sex with somebody till you put a ring on it. 
and there's some man sitting in church right now. I knew I should not have brought her to church today. <laughs> no, no, ma'am, he should have brought you to church today. And you and him need to get to this altar or get to your car or get to wherever y'all need to get. And you and him need to get before God and you and him need to confess. You and him need to be forgiven. You and him need to repent. And you and him need to ask for self-control until the day that you stand before God and enter into the covenant of holy matrimony to him. That's what you do. And you take any sin and put it in that blank. And I know people tell us preachers, you can't preach like that in this day and time. They won't come. <sighs> you can't preach holiness. You can't preach sanctity. You can't preach purity. You can't preach morals or your church won't grow. I would rather have a church of a hundred people that are maturing in Jesus Christ and doing it God's way than pastor a church of 20,000 people that somebody standing on a stage telling them you can live life however you choose to live it. You know what Eve and Adam did in the Garden of Eden? They said, Lord, we're going to live life like we choose to live it. It wasn't about biting an apple. It wasn't about eating from a tree you weren't supposed to eat from. It was the decision that they made that they knew better for them than their creator knew for them. And every day, you and I at some point are guilty of making that same decision. Well, well I, I, I'm a grown man, Brian, and I got needs. I can't do without this sexual activity till I'm married. What? Really? Now, let me tell you what you do every time you, you, you feel like you need a cold shower. Let me tell you what you do. You go get your Bible out and you start reading about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Every time you have those images come into your mind from a video or a magazine or even, a my gosh, a commercial these days, right? Every time you have those images come up when you're trying to pray, you just open your Bible to John 17, 18, 19, and 20, and you just read about the resurrection and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I guarantee you his word will change your mind. You won't need a cold shower, baby, because you just got washed with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And he'll settle everything that needs to be settled. And he'll stimulate everything that needs to be stimulated. And you will go into your marriage with the blessing and the anointing of God yes. upon it. Yes. I'm going to tell you something. I didn't do it right the first go around. But thank God he gave me a second chance. Am I the only one that's had a second chance in here? I bet not. But Mitzi and I made a commitment with each other the second go around. And we said, we're going to do this God's way. And we did it God's way. And I want to tell you something. I'll take it God's way before I'll take it the world's way any day of the week. Young people always say what I said when I was young. I'd be listening to the preachers I grew up under, Jack Turner and Valton Douglas and Jackie Cook. Philip Duncan they'd all be up there talking about this holiness stuff and purity stuff and I was back there as a youth or a child in that church and I was back there thinking the whole time well yeah you got to live your life you got to sow your oats you got to do all that you did and now you're up there preaching and you want me to miss all the fun well see what those guys knew that I was too ignorant at that point to realize in my life God had redefined their definition of fun because they knew where that fun was going to take them they had seen the end result of what the world calls fun they have seen the conclusion of what Satan calls fun and it doesn't look so pretty on the backside so I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to get somebody's attention this morning it may have had that same thought go through yours. You're 52 year old now, Brian, and you've had your fun. Let me have mine. I'm just trying to show you and tell you there's a better way. There's a way to avoid all the nastiness in this world. And you say, well, it's too late for me. I, I, I've already committed. I've already been involved. No, 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 no. It's not too late. 
God can make you brand new again. God can remake everything in you. I don't know who's done what or what's done who. I don't know if it's been intentional, unintentional. I don't know if there's been molestation. I don't know if there's been rape. I don't know if there's been abortion. I don't know if there's been homosexuality, pornography, drug use. I don't know any of those things. But here's what I know. My God is larger than all of them. Here's that I do know. I guarantee that right there. And if you will take God's word. So you don't have to take my word. You take God's word this morning. And if you will this morning hear this from me, stop trying to mix God and his way and Satan in his way. People have had tried to do it for time immemorial. It has never worked. And folks, we is last day bride of Christ. Do you realize we are last day Christians? Folks, we're in the last of the last days. It's up to us. We can't wait around and say, oh, God's raising up a great generation. We can't wait. We don't have time for God to raise up a generation. We've got to take this and we've got to run with this and we've got to show this level of purity to the world where we keep the standard of God's word high in our life and not sacrifice that standard for anyone or anything. Well, Brad, I've been married for years. I've never cheated on my wife. And well, you know, what, 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 what are you willing to do for money? So you got to just start filling in these blanks because we love to talk about what we don't do that other people do because it makes us feel better. But the whole time we talk about what we don't do that other people do, we need to be looking at what we're doing that they may not be doing. Because that's just one of the greatest manipulative tools of the devil is to get our eyes on somebody else. Do y'all remember that morning that Jesus was having breakfast with the disciples after his resurrection and they were cooking fish over there on the banks of the Sea of Galilee and Jesus reinstated Peter and then he evidently just told Peter hey get up and come walk with me and they started walking down that uh, boulevard there by the Sea of Galilee and Jesus and Peter were talking and Peter looked over at Jesus and all of a sudden he caught John following him in the background and he he asked Jesus "Well, well Jesus what about him and Jesus basically told Peter to mind his own business right he said what is he to you if I choose for him to never die until I come again, that's none of your business. You keep your eyes focused right here. We got too many people looking over their shoulders and around at what everybody else is doing and not spending enough time looking at what we're doing, what I'm doing. I'm going to tell you what, when I focus on me, I really ain't got a whole lot of time to fool with y'all. I'm, I mean, that's bad pastoring and I understand it. But if I'm really focused on me, but here's the good thing. If I'll really focus on me, the Lord will do what I need to have done in my life. For my life will be so close and in tune with him that I can actually then be released to minister to others. And be that good Samaritan checking the ditches and not always in a hurry, just taking care of me. I've spent most of my life just taking care of me. Man, I almost stopped the song service, not because it wasn't wonderful. It was wonderful, but I almost stopped it. But I'm going to do what I want to do then right now, Okay. I wanted to just stand up and prophesy something and I'm going to prophesy it now. There's going to be some people that were sitting in this worship service today that when you leave here, you ain't going to be able to stand the taste of a cigarette. You're not going to be able to stand the taste of a vape. You're not going to be able to pull up those old images of fantasy in your minds anymore that you used to pull up. The pictures of Jesus on the cross are going to come up in their place. You're not going to, you're not going to desire You're not going to desire the drug that you walked in here thinking about that you were going to do as soon as you left church today. That desire is going to be gone. I'm going to tell you, we were in a stronghold breaking church service today. We were in the anointing of the stronghold breaking Savior today. Jesus Christ broke some chains today. And all you got to do is walk in it. Tim said, ride the wave. I want you to surf your way out of here today. Just do it. And just keep it going. Because you know what the devil's good at? He's good at distractions. Wonderful church service. 
going to go to dinner at the local restaurant and I promise you, you're going to get the worst waiter or waitress you've ever had in your life. And you're going to want to get mad, but then the devil's going to, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit's going to check you on that and say, it's just a distraction. It's just a distraction. I'm not going to mix the devil and God today. I'm staying on God's side. And I'm going to love this young man or this young woman. And you know what? Maybe I didn't get a tea refill today, but I didn't choke to death either. I'm going to be just fine. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to go on and leave a tip anyway, and I'm going to pay my bill, and I'm not even going to post on Facebook how sorry she was. I'm just going to stay on God's side today. And you know what happens when you start to make those kind of choices? The devil loses the ability to distract you. He loses the ability to dull your sword. He loses the ability to steal your joy and to silence your testimony. That's what he does. I had a lady come through the drive through Friday morning and she said, Brother Brian, the devil's been on me this morning. I want to pay for the next five cars in line. She said, every time he comes against me, I'm going to do something good for somebody. Praise God. Man, you don't think those next five people? And there were some big orders. One of them was 20 something dollars. That lady said, thank you. Don't thank me. Thank Jesus. That's how you keep from getting distracted. He's going to try to do his work. Don't let him mix shit up because they ain't getting back together again. Pick a side. I tell people in divorces all the time, I said, look, y'all don't have to pick sides. People are so, they, you know, they're messy. Did y'all know people are kind of messy? They really can be messy. And then when divorces happen, everybody thinks they got to pick a side. Somebody's my friend and somebody's my enemy. You know what? Instead of picking sides for people that are going through divorce, why don't we just stay neutral and pray? Why don't we just pray for them? Divorces are ugly by nature. They're nasty by nature. Why why don't we just pray for them? Let's just make a a covenant together as church folk, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray against all divorce, all of it. Yes, Yes, pray against it all. But inevitably, something's going to go down that it's going to be necessary. I understand that in our day and time. But what we can do is not exacerbate the pain. We can begin to just speak peace into the situation and even if there's got to be a separation hopefully it can be an amicable one and it doesn't have to destroy hearts and children and everything else but in this separation you need to understand you got to pick a side and I've picked God's side and I'm asking him to train me to teach me to mature me to keep me in his word and give me a hunger, more of a hunger for his word. More of a hunger for prayer. That's one of the greatest distractions. If you want a way that you can pray for your pastor, pray for me right there. Pray, pray that my pastor will spend more time in prayer. Because that's one of the, that's one of the things that I can be easily distracted in. I'm, I'm confessing it. Before my brothers and sisters, pray. I'm asking everybody here to pray that I spend more time in prayer. Lord, give him more time. More time to pray. And we got to move some mountains, y'all. We got to part some oceans. There's a lot of times, I hope y'all not watching me worship, but I do some crazy things in worship. I understand that. And I'm bad to start stomping my feet. But I can tell you why I stomp my feet because I'm envisioned in the Jericho walls falling. That's what I'm doing. Every time you see me up here stomping, I'm just seeing walls fall. I'm just doing that, and I don't know why it is. It's been that way in my life a long time. And I got plantar fasciitis in this left foot, and I can promise you it don't even hurt while I'm stomping for Jesus. Just stomp. But we've got to pick a side. I'm urging you to pick God's side. But here's what I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to tell it to you very bluntly. If you're trying to mix the two sides, that's what God calls lukewarm, and that's going to get you vomited out of his mouth. Heaven is not the end all of that kind of lifestyle. Absolutely not the end all of that. You can't live gray for Jesus and expect to experience his glory in eternity. He said, you're either hot or you're cold. Pick a side. Pick a side. And then here's number three. 
Have you ever heard of exile? Exile is all through the Bible. Exile started in Genesis chapter 3. And then we know everything kind of built back up and then we see exile again with Noah and his family and the whole ark story, right? All the world basically were judged. Only people saved were Noah and his family. And then we understand after that all the Abrahamic covenants start in and we start going in and we begin to see, well, it took some judges because people would get, people would get comfortable and then they would get too comfortable. And then they would start mixing in the devil's way with God's way. And all of a sudden you knew people were away from God and, and in exile. So we see it go all through the judges. We see it go all, all through the kings. We see it happen with Babylon. We see it happen with Assyria, with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All these exiles. Now we understand the exiles as far as chronologically in the Bible but here's what I feel like we don't have an adequate understanding of. I believe that we live in a day and time where there is personal exile. Where there's exile in our homes and in our marriages. Where there's exiles in our personal walk with Jesus Christ. I believe when we try to mix the God's way with the devil's way that exile will always come because we've gotten too comfortable with our holy God. We've got too much of our way and our wants and our desires and our dreams mixed into the equation with what God has called us and purposed us for. God has not promised us our dreams. God has promised us his calling to every one of us. Well, what about the desires of my heart, Brian? You better go back and read that. It starts with it being his way first. Because the desires of my heart must match his word before he can ever give me the desires of my heart. Jesus did not die upon Calvary's cross for me to get my way. Because if I got my way, hell would be the end result. Jesus died a cruel death upon Calvary's cross so that, thank God, I don't get my way. What happens when you raise a child and give them everything they want? We've seen the outcomes of that. That's why God refuses to let us be raised spiritually like that. Ever heard of exile? I'm going to tell you what exile does, though. Exile brings people back closer to God, don't it? Because they get so sick of being in the slavery of the world's way of doing things. You know what I think going on in the United States of America right now? It's exile. It's exile. It's not a conservative liberal thing. It's exile. The church has gotten too comfortable and too complacent. The church has gotten too syncretistic, which means they've mixed, we've mixed the world's way of doing things with God's way of doing things. So now our nation and opposing our world has gone into a time of spiritual exile. Well, you know what you have to do to get out of spiritual exile? You come back to God. You start praying for revival. Here's what I believe God wants me to say to you this morning. In this very room, there's some Shadrachs, some Meshachs, and some Abednegoes. In this very room, there are some Daniels. In this very room, there are some Judges, some Samson, some Gideon, some Jephthah. There's some Deborahs in this very room. In this very room, there are some King Davids and some King Solomons. In this very room, there are some Elijahs and some Elishas and some Samuels. In this very room, there are some John the Baptist and some Matthews and some Marks and some Luke's and some Johns and some Barnabases. In this very room, there are those that are going to choose to stand for the standard of God and not bow down to the ways of this world. And when we stand and not bow, Revival is bound to come. Hallelujah. Now what we have to do, church, is be the standard bearers. We have to keep it hot now. We can't go back and fall into the trap. 
And just because it's a close family member that's practicing a homosexual lifestyle, well, now we need to change the gospel and, and now just take Galatians and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians and 1 John and the people that won't inherit the kingdom of God. Let's just take all of that out of there now because we love somebody enough that we don't want them to go to hell. God loves them enough that he don't want them to go to hell either. Matter of fact, he loved them enough to send his own son to die on a cross, but they can't have it their way. And it's just one sin among many. If you can practice open sinful lifestyle of any sin without conviction, you are not saved. Listen to that. Please listen to that. If you can practice an openly sinful lifestyle of any sin... I don't care if it's alcoholism or pornography or lust or greed or gossip, even the Bible says. If you can do it without conviction, you are not saved. People ask me all the time, well, preacher, are you saying you don't have sin in your life? I will never not claim to have sin in my life. Because even the Bible says, if I make the claim not to have sin in my life, I am a liar and I make him out to be a liar. The only sinless one has been Jesus Christ. But I can promise you this. I've prayed this prayer multiple times. Lord, when I do mess up, I want instantaneous conviction, God. Lord, let the Holy Spirit come on me so hard and so heavy that I can't have a moment worth of peace until I'm back in your favor and grace. And that's the way that works. What did King David do in Psalm 51 after all of the Bathsheba and Uriah event? Where did he run to? He ran back to God. He ran back to God. So, I'm doing it backwards this morning. And now I want to read you a chapter of the Bible to close. Because I'm telling you, God and the devil are through. They're never getting back together again. We can stop trying to get them back together again. Because in our vain attempts to get things the way we want them to be, with this mixed up way of living, we've put ourselves into exile, and our country into exile, and our world into exile. So now we're at a place where we've got to stand up and get ready we got to get ready for the fiery furnaces. we got to get ready for the lion's dens. we got to get ready for the pits and the tars and all of those things that these guys and gals went through. we got to get ready for it because we got to stand firm in the name of Jesus Christ. No matter what comes, hell or high water. And we've got to be the standard bearers of the kingdom of God on the face of this earth. And you say this little bitty church ain't going to make a difference. Let me tell you something. Wait a minute right there. This little bitty church ain't going to make a difference. But the God that this little bitty church is worshiping is going to make all the difference. And that's all that matters. I'm not going to make any difference. But the God that I serve has already made all the difference. I'm just going to do exactly what Brother Tim is instructing us this morning. Call it as though it is done. It's finished. It's finished. Listen to these words. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour the child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert. This is the church, a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. 
The great dragon was hurled down the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, time, and half a time, three and a half years out of the servant's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We could read on, but I can tell you how that story ends. Though the devil is filled with fury and though all of his demonic minions are filled with the same furious frustration and their time is growing short, Here's what I just heard. Out of all of his attempts, past, present, and future, he has never been victorious against God, against his son Jesus, against the Holy Spirit, or against you and me, the church. Not one time has what he sought to defeat us with worked and worked out in his favor. Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying? God, in His Son, and in His power of the Holy Spirit, is taking care of His children. You and I have a responsibility. There is no devil in hell, and there is no demon at His bid and in His command that can keep us from accomplishing what God has called us to do. There is no one or no thing that will hold us back from what God has called us to do. Nobody else, nobody else can do it. Nobody, nobody. Church, it's us. There's been a great divorce. And next week, we're going to look at what it cost him to gain custody of us. And the next week after that, we're going to look at the support that comes because he is our custodian. And three weeks from now, I'm going to tell you what's going to go on. I believe there's going to be a beautiful spirit and authority take over this. I believe there's going to be a shift and a quake in the spiritual atmosphere. I believe there's going to be a revival that takes hold of every soul in this place. I believe there's going to be a church that is built, that is standing upon the rock. I believe that the anchor holds. I believe that the cleft in the rock still stands. I believe our God is a mighty bulwark that is never failing. I believe we are part of an end time revival and I'm not setting us apart. I'm setting Jesus apart. This ain't a place to shine. It's a place to serve. And that's what's going to get it done. All I'm inviting you to is the humble, personal walk with Jesus Christ that you will say and commit this morning I surrender everything, Lord. And maybe you've not given your life to Christ, but maybe this would be the day that you would say, God, I'm done. I'm at the end of my rope, Lord. 
Lord, I'm coming to surrender. I don't understand it, and that's okay. He doesn't expect you to understand it. He just expects you to trust Him. Just trust Him. He'll teach you along life's highway. Just trust Him. Maybe you're in here and been saved and been in a relationship with Christ for years, but you've gotten to a point in your life where you're in so big of a dark exile because you've mixed the ways of the world, the ways of the devil, and the ways of God. This is a beautiful time for confession, forgiveness, and repentance. This is a time to put your face in this altar down here. This is a time not to worry about what anybody thinks and get to this altar and take hold of the mercy seat of Jesus Christ and get the blood of Jesus Christ which is the eternal propitiation of our sinfulness. You don't need to get saved again. You need to come out of exile. You need to get out of Egypt and come surrender yourself fresh and free and say, God, I know the problem wasn't with you. It's been with me. God, I choose you. I choose you, Jesus. I choose you. Whether you're choosing for the first time or whether you're choosing him for the 20,000th time, don't leave this place without choosing Jesus. Choose Jesus. Please stand with us. Heavenly Fathers, I'm calling to the Shadrachs and the Meshachs and the Abednegoes. Lord, I'm calling to the Daniels and the Elijahs and the Elishas and the Samuels. Lord, I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that you raise up within these ranks right here in this little church, God, some powerhouses for you, God. Lord, people that will not get full of themselves and try to steal the glory and the honor only due to our God, but will humbly walk circumspectly before our God Lord that's all I'm asking and I believe that's going to introduce a revival into this place and into we people that can go from sea to shining sea and jump the Atlantic and the Pacific and end up going around this globe and Lord there'll be a great coming to Jesus Christ and Lord the next thing we know Gabriel's going to blow that horn the eastern sky is going to part we're going to behold the Lamb of God the graves are going to open up and we're going to be snatched away that's what I'm praying for Jesus but there are billions upon billions on this earth right now that we're calling from the north, the south, the east, and the west to drop the ways of the devil and line up with the ways of our God. Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you. In your name I pray.